السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video This time we're gonna play with some Vulkan and Rust programming language So let's get started Okay, so now uh, when dealing with Vulkan in Rust uh, Or any language really uh, You have two options You either use a binding uh, Or you use a higher level a library that wraps that binding Okay um, so in our case in Rust, there is the best binding is Ash currently, and the best high level library that makes uh, uh, the API safe, the binding safe. It basically wraps over the unsafe uh, binding, which is Ash. So it's called Volcano. Okay. So here is the case. So you have Ash. Uh, if you say Vulcan, uh, Ash, Rust, whatever. It's going to show you the GitHub page for that. And there you go. So I really recommend you to go through this, read a bit about it. Um, and of course, there's also some utility libraries, some examples, some libraries that use Ash and it thinks too. All right. And there's also Volcano, as you can see here, which is a high level um, wrapper over, over Ash that makes it, uh, you know, it's basically Volcano is a Rust wrapper around the Vulkan Graphics API, follows the Rust philosophy, which is that as long as you don't use unsafe code, you shouldn't be able to trigger any indefined behavior. In the case of Vulkan, this means that the non unsafe code should always conform to valid API usage. So, yeah, there you go. It helps you to write safe Vulkan code in Rust. Uh, but of course, uh, that safety does come with a cost, although it's kind of minimal. And it also comes with the cost that you cannot use bleeding edge uh, features because Volcano is essentially handmade. You know, it's not, you know, like uh, Ash basically is not handmade. It's actually generated by, uh, from the API directly from the XML uh, specification of Vulkan. Okay. As you can see, generated from vk.xml. All right. Uh, while Volcano is actually written by hand, uh, everything is written by hand and really uh, well thought about, okay? So it really helps you immensely in terms of writing concise Vulcan code and also making sure it is safe. Uh, but Vul uh, Vulcan Ash, Ash is just the unsafe binding. As you can see, no validation, everything is unsafe, which basically means that you have uh, the fastest experience you can get uh, from Vulkan since you're uh, you're interacting directly with Vulkan with no middleman okay uh, and of course that comes with a cost that is unsafe and it's more explicit just basically it doesn't help you that much although to be honest uh, even Ash even though it's not handmade it still gives you some really cool stuff uh, because, well, it is uh, using a really cool language called Rust. So you have results, you have uh, vectors, um, you have slices, strongly typed handles, default implementation for all types. You have builder and pattern, um, which is really awesome. And you're going to see that it's going to make our lives much easier. There's pointer chains, flags, and constants as associated constant, and debug display for flags. For example, as you can see, when you when you actually print a flag, it shows you the name instead of just a stupid value. Okay, so and you also have extension loading. For example, if you want to use the swap chain extension, you go ahead and create this object called swap chain. And that's basically the loiter for the swap chain extension, essentially. And then you use that swap chain loiter to call uh, that extension's functions, okay? Mm -hmm. That essentially uh, boosts your performance because you're, you're essentially um, loading uh, Vulkan functions pointers directly from the driver instead of going through the loiter every time and dispatching dynamically, so yeah. Row function pointers, supports for extension names, implicit handles, as you can see, optional linking. You can actually add a feature called linked and then essentially, uh, if you if on the other hand, your application cannot handle Vulkan being missing a runtime, you can instead enable the linked feature, which will link your binary with the Vulkan loiter directly, uh, the Vulkan loiter directly and expose the infallible. Infallible basically means that it can never um, fail. So, and you can use entry linked. 
and since it never fails you have to actually make sure that Vulcan is actually in the system or not so uh, yeah anyways uh, for me I'm just gonna use the default loaded cargo feature this is by default it, it is this feature is enabled okay so now let's actually go ahead into the code all right so I have this main uh, hello world program nothing crazy no dependencies yet right so now to actually being able to use ash i'm gonna say cargo add ash and there you go done <laughs> nothing crazy right there that's simple as that no cmake no make nothing just this cargo add ash of course uh, at, at first it's gonna take some time depending on a lot of factors uh, but then after that it just becomes incremental pretty fast stuff okay uh, all right, so the current version while the latest version while uh, recording this video is 0 0.37.2 There you go uh, If you want to make sure everything is working just fine make sure to use the same version as me But I do recommend to use the latest version and just although you may have to tweak something that may not work that uh, because of ver uh, new version, okay But yeah, anyways, so first of all we have to actually uh, create an entry to Vulkan but before we can create an entry to Vulkan, well, let's import some stuff. So I'm going to import use ash, okay? I'm going to import self. Essentially, use uh, I'm going to import ash itself. And then also I'm going to import ash vk, okay? Uh, these two things are needed. All right. And since it's going to bombard me with unused every time, I'm just going to tell it to not do that. So there you go. This is how you do it. Allow unused. And notice that I actually added this guy right here, this exclamation mark, meaning that I want this rule to be applied to the whole um, crate, okay? Or at least maybe the whole file. I don't really know exactly. I, I think it's the whole crate, but yeah. So uh, next up is now we can actually uh, call entry. Okay, so Ash, you know, Lloyd, uh, well, entry, Lloyd. There you go. If you if you're using the linked uh, feature, and by the way, this is how you actually add the linked feature. You say cargo, add, ash, features, and you say uh, you say you give it the feature that you want. In this case, linked, and there you go. It's gonna go ahead and add the linked uh, feature for you. Uh, but in my case, I don't really. Uh, and also after that, how you use linked instead of Lloyd, you just say linked essentially. Notice that it gives you an entry. It doesn't give you a result because it's infallible, okay? But in my case, I'm not going to use uh, that feature. So let's go back. Cargo add ash. Uh, let me just remove this guy. Let's add ash normally without any features because I don't care about that uh, link thing. Okay, I'm just going to use Lloyd. All right. Uh-huh. Now notice that this gives me a result of entry or a Lloyd in error. Now, instead of every time saying the in wrap or saying the expect or whatever, I can just say this, okay? But the thing is, every function could give you a different error or whatever. So uh, instead of dealing with all this stupid errors myself, I'm just gonna use a create cold, uh, uh, which again, makes our lives much easier when it comes to error handling. So I'm just gonna say cargo add anyhow. Okay, and now instead of having to say every function, you have to say result, then give it the type of the success and then give it the type of the error. No, you just give it the type of the success and whatever error comes in, even different errors doesn't matter as long as they, um, they're they implementing STD error. But yeah, otherwise, if they're, if they're option or like if they're an option, then you just add a context to it. And then you can essentially use it as a result. Uh, you can propagate it back into a result, okay? And then there's also uh, functions that return str strings as errors. And for those, you have to map the error into an actual anyhow error using an anyhow macro. But we're gonna see later on how this works. But for now, we're just gonna say use uh, anyhow result. And this is essentially will go ahead and um, uh, replace result the the normal Rust SCD error uh, SCD result with anyhow result, which only takes the result val uh, result type, 
The error type could be anything, really. Uh, as I said, as long as it uh, implements a CD error, I believe. So anyways, so result, and in my case, since this is the main function, of course, it's gonna return void, okay? It's either an error or void. So here at the end of the function, this is gonna say that everything has been run fine. So I'm gonna say, okay, and then gonna give it void. This is a unit called unit in Rust and essentially uh, symbolize a void. Uh, all right, so next step is, as you can see, this operation is unsafe and requires an unsafe function or a block. So to actually use this uh, gracefully, you have to wrap it in an unsafe block. Uh, this interrogation mark could be uh, after the unsafe or before the unsafe, but I recommend to do anything that isn't unsafe outside of the unsafe block. Okay, so that's why I put the integration mark after that, and there you go. Now let's add cargo FMT, and it's gonna make everything cheaper. So yeah, so here we have the entry. As you can see, we're we're done. Nice. Next up, we need the instance. So let instance is equal to what? Well, and save once again. And save what? Uh, okay, so Ash. Uh, well, not ash, entry, entry. So you use the entry to create the instance. So entry dot create instance. Because essentially the entry is just loading the Vulkan implementation to be able to create an instance, to see the instance version, to enumerate the instance extensions, etc. That's what you use entry for. And of course the entry should live as long as the instances that you have created using that entry. And of course the devices should live as long as the instances that, that got created from. So yeah, that's just something to keep in mind about lifetimes. Uh, but anyways, so entry.create instance. Now we should give it a reference to a create info and the allocations callback, you can actually add callbacks uh, for allocation, but I'm just gonna say none because the default allocations for Vulkan are, are pretty good, okay? So next up is syntax error expected semicolon. Okay, let's add a semicolon there. And since this will return the result, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna add that guy and there you go, we got an instance. But of course I have to first of all create a, a create info. Now notice that we used here ash, but right now I'm gonna use a uh, VK. Now essentially in Vulkan you have two types of objects. You have dispatchable and non-dispatchable objects. Essentially, uh, some objects are created and it actually gives you a pointer to that object. And other objects uh, aren't really pointers, they're just opaque uh, pointers. They're just handles that are for, like just numbers, really just U32 numbers uh, that essentially refers to some resource, okay? Kind of like an ID of some sort, not an actual pointer to a memory. Um, and now the thing is when you're dealing with such objects or even maybe like create infos or normal stack structs, you use VK, okay? Uh, but when you're dealing with, with such objects that actually gives you pointers, et cetera, you deal with ash, okay? Now, of course, when you create something, you have to destroy it, that's for sure. And so, yeah, and, and you create and destroy objects, uh, at least you create stuff using ash. Right, for structs, for example, here we're gonna create create info equal to, here we're gonna use vk. So vk, what? vk instance, create info. Now here you have two options. You either can do it the, the way that uh, C does it, which is essentially saying S type, you know, and essentially uh, giving it all the fields that it needs, you know, but this is really, uh, stupid way of doing it. So I'm gonna go with uh, with doing a builder. And of course, also you have to, to set the S type every time, just like how you do it in C. But thankfully uh, in Ash, it also generates builders for each object. So I can see builder and now I can essentially give it uh, whatever uh, for, of course, first of all, uh, you get the type for free, okay, using the builder, so you don't have to set S type at all. And next up, anything that you don't set using the builder, it's gonna be initiated to zero or null, depending on what type it is, okay? Basically the default value for whatever type. 
Now, in my case, um, I can set enable extensions count, enable extension names. And also another case is that instead of setting the count and then giving a pointer to the array or whatever, uh, instead of that, you also have, uh, you can use slices. So if you say here, for example, enable extension names, right? Here, I should actually give it, as you can see, uh, a slice to const i8 okay so a slice to some extensions and a slice essentially will encode both the count and well the array pointer okay so in my case i don't care about enabled extension names i only care about for now um i only care about the the information okay the application info application info and of course notice that we pass in for the create infos we actually pass in an, uh, a reference as you can see here and 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 these builders actually implements uh, dref which automatically builds builds the builder when when you dereference it like this okay uh, so and I don't have to say dot build uh, basically because it implements DRF and does it for me. So that's nice. Although there is some cases that you really need to put build anyway. For example, when you have a, a collection of ins, uh, a collection of builders in an array, then you cannot really, uh, you have to explicitly say dot build. Mm, but yeah. So now let's actually create uh, the application info. Well, let's application info is equal to what vk application info builder okay and here i only care about api version although you can actually say application name application version engine name engine version uh, but these are optional in vulkan api so i only care about api version and even api version if you don't set it or even if you don't set application info then basically we'll uh, use the uh, Vulkan version 1.0 uh, but in my case I'm just gonna show you how you can use the latest one the latest version so uh, VK uh, API version 1.3 and there you go uh, you could also go ahead and say make API version and then you can actually manually give it the variant the major the minor and the patch um just like this uh, for variants it's always zero i believe and patch it's always zero um for now at least and major is one in my case three and there you go but this is the same thing as doing this in this case so uh, well api version one three and there you go. So we got up our application info builder. We passed a reference to it here and the instance create info builder and we passed a reference to it here. Nice. And as I said, it automatically builds those builders when you pass a reference. Nice. Next up, so now that we have our instance here, um, of course, anything that you create, you should destroy. So let's make sure to do that. So in safe, uh, Okay, instance dot destroy. You just take the object and you say destroy on it. So destroy instance none. You give it the allocation callbacks. And that's essentially it. Let me do a little car cargo FMT right there. And there you go, pretty cool stuff. Let's make sure this is running just fine. Cargo R. Yep, pretty cool, pretty cool, pretty cool. And notice that anyhow really makes our job much easier. I can just in any result, I can just say this interrogation mark and it will basically uh, take, uh, you know, basically uh, handle any error for me, essentially. So there you go. Lovely. So next up is um, we're going to select a physical device. Now, uh, don't try to be so smart about this guy. I do see a lot of people trying to be smart about it. And in fact, I was guilty of this also when I was just starting up uh, is to essentially go ahead and do all sorts of craziness for, for choosing a physical device. But if you don't really have any special, really special uh, things, 
about the physical device, just select the first one because it is it is essentially um, the best choice you probably have uh, most of the time. Because in in fact, the OS or the operating system always gives you the first physical device as the as the best physical device. For example. Uh, it could be influenced by the user choice of actually selecting that physical device that, that is the preferred physical device by the user or it could be because of uh, power power settings like for example if uh, the user have economy power uh, mode set it on then well it's going to give you the integrated gpu if there's even if there is a dedicated gpu if the user let's say have uh, two gpus dedicated and integrated and the user have selected the performance mode then what it's going to do it's going to actually go ahead and give you the the dedicated gpu uh, essentially stuff like that in fact even in windows at least uh, there is in settings you can actually set the preferred uh, physical device that you want and maybe even per application okay uh, so just uh, this is how you actually just select the first physical device of course if it does exist and I'm going to show you how you can do this all right so first of all and safe of course so instance dot essentially when you put this in save block you're basically saying to Rust that I know what I'm doing inside of this in safe uh, uh, and essentially call in safe functions and you get responsibility for making sure these stuff are, are safe Otherwise, anything other than what is inside the end save block, it is Rust's responsibility to ensure its safety. Of course, uh, well, at least almost 100%. Uh, but yeah, anyways, you still have to know what you, uh, you know what you're doing. But yeah, anyways, so here I'm gonna say instance dot enumerate uh, physical uh, devices. Okay, so here this gives you a result, vector physical device. Okay, so I'm just gonna propagate if there is any error. Um, otherwise, let's make sure to add a semicolon. Now here you can essentially go through every physical device, you know, and you can call this physical device and go through every physical devices. Uh, for, through every physical device right just like this and do something about the physical device uh, but in my case I'm only gonna select the first one so here is what I'm gonna do I'm just gonna say dot into iterator um, instead of iterator, I'm using into iterator because I basically want to consume the vector you know I don't care about the vector data anymore after this operation so I'm just gonna say into editor instead of editor or enter mute so into editor dot and I'm gonna say dot next. And essentially you could keep on telling next and it will give you the next object in the vector. And this is what essentially is an iterator. You just keep on saying next, next, next until you, you end the, 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 the iterator. Okay, uh, but in this case, since the iterator is just being made and this is the first next that we called, well, this is essentially should give me the first object in the vector or in the iterator, okay? Um, now the thing is next gives you an option. It could be none or well some object. Now if it is none, that means that there's no next. Okay, so essentially you have reached the end. Uh, there's no object left in the iterator. Um, otherwise, if it gives you some objects. Well, there you go, success. Uh, so now I want to use uh, this guy to basically if there is some if if there is not. Like if we don't find the first object, then we essentially want to error and propagate the error back into the main function. So, but the thing is we cannot actually do this right now since the integration mark operator can only be used on results, not options. Because in fact, we don't have a result here. We have an option. So we cannot really use this operator directly. Uh, so here's how to, to fix this. Now in, in anyhow, uh, there's a cool way of doing this you could say anyhow result and there's also another object or actually a trait this is a trait called context okay now when you import this trait now you can actually go ahead and on every um, option now you can say dot context again if you don't import that trait you cannot use this uh, function dot context okay and then you give it an error of your own so 
Essentially, you turn the option into a result by giving it an error message, okay? So dot context, and you tell it what is the error message. So, well, no physical device found. And since this is becoming messy, let's say cargo FMT to make, uh, to make it much nicer for us. And as you can see, there you go, pretty cool stuff. And save, and since enumerate physical device, we turn it into an aerator, we get the next object, which is the first object. Then if we don't find that, we say no physical device found, and there you go. Lovely stuff, and essentially context gives you a result. So it takes an option and gives you a result. Lovely stuff. Okay, so next, so I got my physical device as you can see here. And as you can see, I also don't have uh, any access anymore to the vector because in that, right now it, it is actually consumed by into editor. So, yep, 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 nice. Next up is after getting the physical device, we have to create the device. Um, and notice that I don't need to, to uh, destroy this physical device because in fact it is not, uh, we, I didn't create it, you know, I just enumerate it, okay? And in fact, physical device, it's not uh, a pointer to some kind of objects. It's just an uh, opaque handle, a po opaque pointer. It's just a number uh, that indicates, I mean, let me see if I can show you here. Uh, there you go, physical device. As you can see, as you can see, there is non-dispatchable, and there is just a defined handle. So non-dispatchable objects, well, you have to create them and also destroy them. For just handles, they're just uh, uh, U32s essentially. If I say define handle, well, there is all this sorts of craziness. Uh, but essentially, internally, uh, a physical device is just a number. It's not really a pointer. But yeah. Next up, let's actually create the device. So device, of course, again, and save. Uh, you can actually go ahead and create some functions to wrap uh, this and save stuff. Uh, but yeah, for now, let's just go with this. So next up is in uh, instance. Again, we're going to use the instance, and we're going to say create device here you give it the physical device that you've chosen for this uh, instance of course you could create multiple devices and this is essentially a logical device so we have chosen a physical device which is an actual device like a gpu or a cpu or, or anything that can handle uh, that implements vulcan essentially the vulcan api um, and that is confirmed. Otherwise, if you're on Mac, by the way, you have to actually go ahead and do some extra steps and also to go ahead into and to the, into the extensions to this uh, instance great info builder and actually add the extension for, uh, uh, it's called, to be honest, I don't remember. But anyways, you have to actually do some extra stuff that you can research. Uh, right now, and also you have to download the VK Molten, Molten, I think, which essentially wraps over the Metal API. But anyways, uh, just let I'll just let you know that you have to do such a thing. But basically, so device, you could create multiple devices, and by the way, one device could actually go ahead and you could have basically multiple devices, logical devices over one physical device or even over multiple physical devices. So you could have one device that wraps around multiple, even even multiple physical devices using groups and stuff. But of course that needs an extension, but I'm just telling you this to see how, why we do need a physical device and a logical device. Uh, but yeah, so, so essentially a device is like an interface to the physical device or physical devices, uh, but yeah. So in this case, I just give it one physical device. And here I give it a create info, of course, let's not uh, forget about the reference. And here allocation callbacks, none in my case. And this is gonna give me a result as you can see here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add the interrogation mark and the semicolon. There you go. And with that, I get the device. But before getting the device, I need to give it the create info. All right, so the thing is, I don't really care about create info anymore, okay, of the instance create info builder. And in fact, you know, for scoping, for scoping, we could do this much better. 
you know um, and here is how you essentially do it so for instance you could actually add it in a scope okay just to make this much nicer much more organized uh, you could actually now since I added this scope now I can essentially give this here put this here since in this application info and create info are only used by create instance and now essentially i want to return this create in this instance i just have to remove that semicolon from there and there you go lovely stuff do i need semicolon yeah i do need it here okay and there you go lovely stuff now I essentially scope this application info and create info only for this place and essentially when we're done with this scope application info create info will go go will go away from the stack uh, okay and also now we cannot access them that's for sure okay as you can see so it doesn't pollute our main function stack okay lovely and i can essentially do the same thing for any other object uh, for example here device I can do the same exact thing I can do this uh, I can do this uh, okay and now of course I can remove the semicolon and now here I can essentially give it the the create info create info is equal to what I by the way I don't want to like ideally you would like to put this into functions if you want uh, to abstract them into functions, structs, uh, objects, etc. But right now, I I just because you know dealing with the OOP and and uh, structs and abstraction and stuff is kind of makes it even harder and crazier, especially with Vulkan. So I'm just gonna stick to everything in one in one function. Okay. So let's create info. Also, especially with the because it's not like C where you can just create a new function and there you go that's just a section of code. No, in in uh, in Rust it's kind of hard uh, to actually abstract a little bit hard because in fact you have to deal with memory and you have to to think about how memory will be used and make sure that it is safe because Rust is won't let you compile a program that is unsafe. Okay, as long as you don't actually set this unsafe block. But yeah. Cannot find value create info in this scope. Okay, let's now create this device create info. So vk uh, device create info, and of course I'm gonna use my builder. So builder dot. Now I can give whatever I want to this device. Now to create a device, you could give it the extensions, you could give it features, layers, etc. Now I don't care about all of this stuff. And by the way, uh, in instance. If you want error checking in Vulkan, because in fact by default error checking is not being done uh, by Vulkan, but if you want error checking, you could add the extension for that extensions for that in the instance. But in my case, instead of doing that, I can just use something called the uh, vk uh, vk config, right? Vk config. By the way, if you actually downloaded the uh, the SDK, you can just say VK cube, and there you go, you got your cube right there. Uh, it's in the Vulkan SDK. Uh, but there's also a lot of other uh, stuff. But yeah, I only care right now about VK config. Now, this uh, will allow you to actually enable validation without having to, to add more logic into your uh, application, okay? Uh, which, which is quite nice. And there's also all of these options that it would be kind of hard to actually deal with it in the program itself so but here as you can see you can easily just check something and there you go you have multiple presets etc um, you have all of this beautiful stuff there's also multiple layers as you can see here um, but yeah you just run this Vulkan configurator while you're developing your Vulkan application and you're gonna get errors as long as you didn't break anything here <laughs> okay so that's essentially it let me make sure i didn't break anything but first of all let's let's uh device create info uh, for example if you didn't specify some uh something that you should have specified or you've done something wrong with dealing with vulcan api it's gonna actually tell you here in the output uh, when you run the program but if you don't have validation layers on either using the Vulkan configurator or using the inst extensions, 
then well, you're not gonna get any errors. <laughs> it's just it's gonna crash. And that's it, uh, maybe. So yeah, or maybe not crash, uh, not necessarily crash. Well, anyways, anyways, because in fact the the layers could give you also uh, information about something that could be not really f performance friendly, um, or maybe something that is just will lead to something bad in the future or whatever anyways so builder dot now i only care about let's see now when you create a device you also tell it which cues you want to use now essentially there's multiple cues um multiple cues now if you're if you have installed the the vulcan sdk you're also going to get a vulcan caps viewer okay in Windows, at least in Linux, uh, you don't go get that by default. You have to install that. Uh, in fact, if you go to here, you could actually go ahead and search for it. Vulkan Caps Viewer. Now, this is really interesting. It will really help you either if you're advanced or beginner. It will really help a lot. So here you go. This is the project. Uh, it's written by a really uh, skilled person called Sasha Willems. All right, so there you go. There's also an online database for Vulkan GPUs, as you can see. And here you have a database for all the GPUs and what their information are, uh, which is quite lovely. For example, if you select one device here, you can see the device, the name, driver version, the type, the properties, as you can see, uh, the features, the extensions. So basically, essentially, you don't have to to buy a GPU to know what is pro what its Vulkan properties, you know, and Vulkan stuff. And of course, of course, uh, the 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 uh, specification, or should I say, the device properties, features, extension, etc., really differs through the the physical device first of all. Which GPU are you talking about? Is it Nvidia, RTX? I don't know, sixty or something. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, also the driver and the driver version and the OS, the operating system, which operating system you're talking about. But yeah, you could see all of that information here, which is pretty lovely. You could also see the coverage of each thing. For example, if you say extensions, uh, for example, VK EMD buffer marker uh, coverage is 19.50. 15%. So 19.15% of reports about GPUs and drivers uh, actually supports such extension. But of course, uh, you can notice that this is AMD. They have this AMD, which means it only for this extension is only for AMD, or at least created by AMD. Okay, so next up is EXT. This is essentially means that it, it is, uh, it is, compatible with different, it is not an official extension, but it's actually supported by multiple vendors essentially, or maybe created by multiple vendors. I don't know exactly, but yeah, something like that. At least that's what I understood. There is Google, for example, it's, this is essentially made by Google. Uh, it's probably for Android, so yeah. XCX, uh, there's all sorts of, stuff. now KHR, when you see KHR, this is an official extension, okay? Uh, by whoever created the Vulkan API, which is the, I don't know how to, to spell it, but KHR, KH uh, Ronos, right? Um, so yeah, the group, uh, KHR group. There's also NV for NVIDIA, MVK, NVX, QCOM, Qualcomm basically, uh, Valve, uh, the one that creates team. Well, anyways, so there is all this sort of stuff. This is just something to keep in mind that you can actually go ahead and do. And in fact, there is a website for this, I believe. No, this is the online database. Where is the website for this guy? Let's see. Uh, there you go. Here. This is the website for to, to download for Windows, X11 Wayland for Linux and Android, uh, which is lovely. There's also a uh, uh, Play Store application for this. So you can also see the your phones. And of course, uh, the nice thing about Vulkan is that it is cross-platform. You could run it in the same application could run in Android, in 
in uh, Linux, in Windows, whatever. Even in console, that's supported by the console manufacturer. But anyways, maybe at least. But yeah. Next up is well. Uh, oh yeah, I wanted to show you the uh, the Vulcan. Uh, uh, what is it called? Yeah, Vulcan Caps Viewer. Okay. Vulcan Caps Viewer. There you go, Vulcan Caps Viewer. In my case, it is. it came with the Vulcan SDK, so that's nice. You can go to the Lunar G um, website and essentially download that. Now here's the case, sorry for the for blinding your eyes, but there you go. I don't know how to turn this into a dark mode. But anyway, so the, you have key families right here. You select a device here and you can see all of this stuff about your device. Okay, properties, features, extensions, formats, key families. Now this is what's really interesting to me, okay? Now you have multiple key families as you can see here. You have key family zero. In my case, at least it is I have three key families um, and essentially a key family is kind of like it essentially represents uh, what were the capabilities of queues of a particular queue group uh, but you'll see what I mean in a second so if I see for example this the first key family I have 16 queues okay and each of those all of those 16 queues does support presentation to the screen using the swap chain and also supports graphics operations, graphics commands, compute commands, transfer commands, and sparse binding, okay? This is the first key family. Um, the second key family doesn't, as you can see, support, uh, there is two queues, first of all, and it only supports transfer. It doesn't support compute and it doesn't support graphics. While key family zero did actually support those, okay? And also it this one doesn't support presentation. Now there's also key family two, which also supports presentation, but it doesn't support graphics. It only supports compute. And by the way, if a key family supports compute or um, the other guy, which is called uh, graphics, right? If it, if it supports any of these, then it implicitly, uh, you know, implicitly uh, supports transfer. So the driver doesn't have to tell you that it uh, that it uh, supports transfer if it tells you that it supports compute and and graphics. And in fact, in my in my Android device, when I checked, it only told me graphics, but it didn't tell me that it's transfer. But it's indeed it need it does support transfer because in fact, if if it supports compute or graphics, it surely supports transfer essentially. So that's just something to know, to keep in mind. Mm, but yeah, uh, next up is expected to find. Uh, all right, so now essentially when we create our device, what we have to do is that we have to uh, request the queues that we're gonna work with, okay? So we have to, uh, f for example, if you want to, to use graphics commands, then we have to make sure that the key family that we're using supports graphics. But really the, the, the most relevant thing, like the thing is the most common configuration is that the, the first key family reported is the one that supports graphics. Of course, if the GPU supports that. Compute is guaranteed. You're, you're guaranteed by the Vulkan specification that if a device is, uh, if a Vulkan confirmant device is found, then it surely have at least one key family and that key family at least have compute. And of course, transfer. So, and at least one queue, of course. Um, but yeah, that's essentially it. So, for now, you could actually go ahead and check for if the for the key family that supports graphics and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But right now, I'm just gonna hard code it for now. I'm just gonna say key family zero. Uh, I'm gonna get the first queue. It doesn't matter which queue you get as long as it exists in the key family, uh, because they are all the same, really. 
And by the way, uh, if you notice here that uh, this guy, for example, QFamily1 only, only supports transfer and they only have two queues. Now this really indicates something for me, which is that this QFamily1 is probably a dedicated transfer um, queues, okay? So this two queues, because, and why I knew that is that it only supports transfer. It doesn't support anything else other than transfer. That's the first thing. And second thing is that there is low count of queues. There's only two queues. While the other is like, for example, this guy have 16, this guy have eight, you know? So what you could do, if you really want, you could use this queue family one. You could like use this queue family one for transferring like, you know, big textures, etc. you know, big, a lot of data to the GPU. And you could also go ahead and take a queue from for, for graphics or two queues or depending on how your setup is. Um, but essentially every queue is kind of like analogous to analogous to, uh, two threads, two CPU threads, essentially. So you can think about that the key family zero have 16 threads, you know, something like that. But essentially every queue kind of like runs independently of the other queue, essentially. Um, there's also this minimum image transfer to granularity, um, uh, which is interesting, but I'm not gonna describe right now. Supports presentation. This is essentially a requirement when you're transferring images. It has to be like a multiple of, of these guys right here. Otherwise you cannot actually transfer. For example, here you could in fact uh, upload a image or transfer an image of width and height and depth of one, one pixel. Okay, so yeah, anyways one pixel depth one interesting okay so yeah so as i said you could take a queue from here for graphics uh, and you could take a queue here uh, for transfer for dedicated transfer and of course it's going to be much faster uh, in terms of transfer Although there is one thing is that this minimum image transfer granularity is guaranteed to be one, one, one when it comes to graphics, uh, graphics queue families. Although I'm not sure about compute, but at least graphics, it is guaranteed. Uh, but for, for example, transfer units, it could be actually two or whatever. So you have to make sure that your images aligns to that transfer granularity. But this is just something to keep in mind for now. Um, and also you could get another queue for, for presentation. Like this is, looks like only supports compute and transfer. So you could use this, for example, you could get a queue from here and use it for maybe post-processing and also presentation, okay? Uh, which is quite interesting uh, because this only supports compute and supports true and there's only eight queues which means it's it's much more specialized uh, essentially so when you have less queues it means that it's much more specialized and of course less flags so yeah or you could take one queue or multiple queues from the one queue family which is here which supports graphics compute and transfer and so you don't have to deal with multi multi threading a lot uh, and it also supports presentation so you could use this for everything but of course if you want multi threading well you got the point anyway so enough blah blah for now <laughs> so now let's just go ahead and actually uh, request our queues so queue create infos there you go. Here, uh, instead of, for example, the C API, you have to actually give it a pointer and a count, how much uh, elements in the array. Now, in the case of Rust, you're binding right here in using a builder, you only give it the, give it a, like, a, a slice, okay, a slice. Uh, so you essentially say this, and you say, now let me actually say Q create infos. Okay, Q create infos. There we go. Mm. 
of course let's not forget about this guy uh, now let's make sure to have Q create infos is equal to vacate well and it's gonna be an array or you could use also a, a vector if you want doesn't matter essentially a slice in Rust is kind of generalized uh, you could use it with anything that is well an array vector whatever uh, so here we're gonna create a device Q create info now in my case, I'm basically just gonna hard code it right now to zero for key family, and I'm gonna get the first key. Uh, okay, so device key create info. Uh, how do I do it again? Yeah, builder, builder dot. Now here you tell it which key family you want. Okay, key family index. Okay, you give it which key family. In my case, it's gonna be zero. And how much queues do you want? Now in in C API or you're not using the builder, you have to again to set how much queues do you want and the priorities, etc. But in my case, I can just set the queue priorities and it will actually go ahead and set the count for me automatically. Okay. So here I can say uh, reference to queue priorities. Uh-huh. I'd rather not say reference of an array inside, like inside of this stuff, because you may have problems with lifetimes of the objects. Uh, just be aware of that. Okay, so here, Q priorities. And of course, in, in the case, for example, for Q priorities, let's say like references like this, it just needs to live as long as you create the object that depends on it. For example, when you create device, then you don't need any reference that you have, to, you gave it essentially. It will copy any of the data that you gave it. So yeah. Q priorities is equal to what? Is equal to an array. And I'm gonna have only one, one thing. And the nice thing about Rust is that it just infers for me the type of whatever I want, right? Uh, from, for example, here when I actually pass this queue priorities to here, to this function that takes in this slice, it just infers to me that it is a slice of F32, which is lovely. Uh, so yeah, if you want two queues, then you can actually add another uh, kind of priority, et cetera. But yeah, uh, essentially you could have multiple uh, priorities for each queue. So so a queue in could could get more processing power from the GPU, but this is not necessarily the case. Most GPUs don't really care about priorities anyways. So yeah, if you have one one queue though, uh, it could be even zero. One doesn't matter because you have one queue and you have nothing to prioritize, right? <laughs> so yeah, uh, for me, I'm just gonna say one point zero because. Okay, so key family index, key priorities. Now, since I have only one key priorities, I could also do a little trick, uh, which I've seen here. If you see here, there it is. Uh, let me see where I can find it. Pointer chains, builder parent. Essentially, it was std slice. Let me just, there you go, from ref. Uh, okay. As you can see, if you have one thing, one object, then you can say a C slice from ref. And by the way, one thing that I forgot to do just to, to tell you that it, uh, in this case, you have to say dot build because the, the builder is inside of an array. So yeah, but instead of doing this, you could use this kind of uh, trick that we have here, a CD slice from ref. Since I only have one object, I could say a CD. So I don't need this guy. So a CD slice from ref. Okay. And then here I can give it the object that I want. Okay. So from ref. And then of course you actually take in the address here. And uh, as you can see, I don't need to actually say dot build here. 
because I already tell it the reference. All right, so now I don't even need this anymore. I could do the same trick with Q priority since there's only one, but first of all, let me actually try to vacate FM, uh, well, not vacate, uh, FMT, cargo FMT, there you go. But of course, first of all, I need uh, to make sure, where is that guy, expected line 32. Expect to the semicolon here. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. No. What? Oh oh oh. Never mind. Uh, here here. Right. Cargo FMT and there you go. Nice. So it makes it much nicer to me right now. So instead of doing this also, since I have only one Q priority, I could do the the same trick once again. Uh, a CD slice from ref okay and here i can say uh reference of 1.0 i believe but looks like you cannot really reference yeah you cannot really reference uh something like this right uh interesting Q priority. What if I say just 1.0? Yeah, so it looks like I cannot really do this right here uh, in a suitable way. So, mm -hmm. so I have some problem here. Oh, yeah, essentially, this should, as I said, yeah, this should be created. Uh, yeah, so device pre well Q create info Q create info. Although we're using that from ref thing, but surely it should not be created in the same place because it will it should live long enough. And that's where basically Rust tells you that you're doing something wrong with memory. <laughs> um, so expected a semicolon. Well, uh, let Q create info, and there you go. So I got my Q. So when you have one Q create info, then you actually go ahead and use this trick that I've told you, essentially. You should make sure that it is not created in the same place because it should live long enough. And there you go. Pretty cool stuff. I love that. And by the way, if you have multiple queues, you know, like let's say for example, multiple queue families, right? Um, let's say Q2, for example, then you have, let's say Q family index one. You don't, if you, if you only have one queue, you don't have to go ahead and create another queue priorities if, if it's not different, just passing the same reference to the same, you know, array, no need to create multiples. Uh, but yeah, that's just something to keep in mind if you Cargo FMT, so there you go. Now we should hopefully be able to create the device with no problems. Um, create device from ref. So, yep, 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 yep. Let's say cargo R. So we have a problem, as you can see from validation, and there is an object leak. So I'm leaking something, and I guess I know, because, yeah, object VK device has not been destroyed. As you can see, it's telling me that you have to destroy the device. And of course, I have to destroy the device before destroying the instance. I cannot destroy the device after the instance. That shouldn't be the case, because essentially the device should out uh, the, the instance should outlive the device. Okay, um, so yeah. In safe device, the destroy device. None. I don't need this or what? Yeah, seems like I don't need the semicolon there somehow. Uh, so now if I cargo FMT, cargo run. Right now, I don't get any validation errors, as you can see, because I destroyed the device successfully. Lovely. Next up is 
So I successfully created the device, but I didn't get the queue. Yes, the queues have been requested by the with the device, etc. But I need to get a handle, a reference to the queue. So how to do that? Well, let queue is equal to device dot get queue. Get device queue. You give it the queue family index that you want, zero in my case, and the first queue family, uh, the first queue in the that queue family. Uh, yeah, that Q family. So this operation is in safe. And notice that it, this doesn't give us a, a result. Uh, it, it just gives us the object directly, which is kind of uh, not so safe, <laughs> okay? Because it, it, we may crash or something, I guess, if if we selected something that is not ours, that is not a valid queue, uh, the, the, the queue that we didn't request essentially, but yeah. Cargo FMT, cargo R. Let's see, everything is fine. But what if I actually done something like this? I just wonder what's gonna happen here. There you go, I get a validation error. Lovely. Uh, so as you can see, uh, family index one is not one of the key families given via vacate device create queue create info structure when the device was created. The Vulcan spec states key family index must be one of the key family indices specified when the device was created. Okay, so I just get a validation error. So yeah. Anyways, right now this is it for the context. So yeah. Now, right now, it's the, what we need to do is to go ahead and allocate buffers right now. Since right now we have our queue that we can actually use to submit commands to the GPU. We have our device to create buffers, for example, to do all sorts of crazy things. And that's essentially it. So now let's actually go ahead to the GPU allocator. Okay, so there is two things. There's RC RS, which is a binding to the allocator VMA, the, the famous MD Vulcan memory allocator. And I would like to actually use this, but VKMemRS doesn't look like it is working currently. It's broken currently uh, for some reason. Um, maybe it's not maintained anymore. I don't know really to be honest, but essentially it's broken currently with the latest uh, Ash crate. So that's why we're not gonna use it. We're gonna use GPU allocator. And this one is written in pure Rust. It's essentially doing the same task, allocating. Well, we could actually allocate ourselves, allocate a buffer ourselves, uh, but it's kind of, uh, First of all, it is not as easy. Uh, you, can, you have to do a lot of crazy things with with uh, memory and stuff. But essentially, you have multiple kinds of memory. You have uh, the device memory, which could be the GPU memory essentially, and then the CPU memory. Okay, so you have to basically manage your memory allocations in the GPU, which is not an easy task. Well. You could just go ahead and allocate a new memory for each buffer, et cetera, but this is of course not efficient. Um, what you really wanna do is allocate once, one big buffer, for example, and then just all allocate sub allocations, that, if that makes sense. But create, basically create multiple sub allocations for the buffers. For example, let's say you have two buffers. Uh, the way you could do it is you could, you know, allocate memory, like the simplest way you can allocate memory for buffer one, then allocate memory for the second buffer, but this is not efficient. Uh, but you could do it yourself. You could allocate one buffer and then use it for both buffers, if that makes any sense. But anyways, uh, in our case, we're just gonna make our lives much easier using the GPU allocator right here, this lovely crate. And as you can see, you have a beautiful uh, example. And by the way, you could use this with Vulkan and also D3D12, which is lovely. So now let's actually go ahead and, and uh, do our job. 
uh, but in fact before doing this let's get rid of some things that we don't uh, like we don't need the allocator yet so let's do some things before that let's start by creating a command pool this is essentially the object that we're going to create that we're going to use to allocate command buffers now well command buffers are just buffers just like normal buffers but they're more special okay they're command uh, for for buffering commands okay to the gpu so uh, essentially the thing is there is a big way there's a big distance between the gpu and the cpu okay and, and the ram and the memory uh now the thing is it's going to take a lot of time uh for you to to go between these two between the cpu and gpu it's like you're going from one city to another and you're pretty far away what you're going to do let's say you have a truck okay now and you have let's say 1000 objects to to transfer using that truck or 10000 or whatever doesn't matter uh, so what you're gonna do are you gonna every time just load one one object in your truck and then go ahead to the other city then go back and get one object and then you know keep on doing like that it's gonna take you forever right but if you go ahead and buffer <laughs> you know like collect as much as possible of objects into your truck so you can develop deliver them in one batch in one in, uh, in one in one shot you know then well you, you can even if, if it fits you can even deliver all those 1000 objects or whatever in one way that's essentially the, the thing about GPU and CPU stuff so instead of every time sending one command to the GPU uh, every time no uh, we essentially prepare as much commands as possible and then send them in one batch to the gpu we're using the queue to send that those commands but yeah that's essentially it so here what we need uh, device dot creates command pool here we need the reference to create info and allocation fallbacks none there you go. Uh, next step is syntax error expected semicolon, of course. Now let's create that, create info. And of course, let's do the same kind of thing for scoping. We don't need the semicolon here. Let's make sure to uh, uh, do it like this. All right, lovely. So now, now what? Let's create info. It is equal to vacay command pool create info. Builder dot. Now what we need? Uh, we could set up the key family index if you want. Although I don't think this is, you know, really needed. I don't think this is required. I don't really remember, but yeah, you could actually go ahead and do that. Uh, and that's what I've done here. Q family index. And what's next? Is there anything else interesting? Doesn't look like there is flags though, which is really, really interesting. But in my case, I don't really care. I don't need them. Uh, but essentially this com the command pool, uh, you know what? Let me just show you the, those uh, those. Uh... Yeah, let me see. Great flags. There you go. Okay, so there is transient. There is reset command buffer. Now, for example, if you're gonna be re-recording -re command buffers, you have to set this reset command buffer thing. As you can see, command buffers may release their memory individually. And here, command buffers have a short lifetime. If the command buffers have a short lifetime, they can also use this transient bit. So essentially, you tell it how you would like to allocate your buffers uh, so it can optimize as much as possible. And sometimes even allow you to do some things that you cannot do it, uh, otherwise. Uh, but yeah. Now, hopefully, 
it's done yep so this is the command for and of course since I created it I have to destroy it so in save man pool or destroy what oh yeah device device dot destroy command pool there you go you give it the command pool that you're talking about then you give it the allocated callbacks in my case none and there you go and I think maybe it does give us an error no hold on no no it doesn't give any error as you can see here uh, it's void Argo FMT, lovely. Okay, so let's command pool. Now let's command buffer. I'm only gonna be creating one command buffer. But the thing is about Vulkan to maximize your gains <laughs> from the GPU, you have to create basically multiple command buffers in multiple threads, prepare them in multiple threads in the CPU, then essentially use multiple queues, which are GPU threads to send as much commands as possible to execute as much commands as possible in parallel etc and that's how you actually really use Vulkan to its full potential but in our case we're only using one queue and we're gonna create one command buffer and there you go <laughs> simplest possible thing okay and we're using one queue for transfer for compute for presentation or whatever but in my case we're not gonna have any presentation in fact if you want presentation and that we're gonna i may create a tutorial about it in the future but essentially if you want that you have to actually add the feature for swap chain in the device that you have to add in the inst in the instance uh the extensions needed to create uh, to present to the window the swap chain etc anyways um for now there you go I'm only using Vulkan, pure Vulkan, and I'm not even gonna be using any compute or any um, graphics right now. I'm only gonna be using transfer <laughs> stuff, so yeah. So let command buffer is equal to what? To, let's see, uh, command buffer. Well, in safe. Uh, of course, let's add this guy and let's say and save what and save what and save. Uh, uh, let me add that interrogation mark. Now let's say device dot actually not device command pool I believe dot allocate. Can you do that? No, I I have to use the device right. So allocate command buffers, and here I have to give it a reference to create info. Let's go. So let's create info is equal to what? Well, by the way, let's make sure to add a semicolon there. There you go. So create info is in fact a vector to command buffers. What? Hold on a second, what? Uh, uh, really? No, it's a command buffer allocate info. These guys are talking about uh, vacate result vector. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So no, this doesn't make sense. Anyways, let's just create our create info here. Uh, command buffer allocate info. There you go. Uh, builder dot. Here, instead of command buffer count and that stuff like that. First of all, let's set the command pool that we're talking about that we want to use to allocate command buffers. Uh, well, I'm gonna uh, give it the command pool that we're talking about. There you go. And uh, by the way, notice that. Um, hold on a second. What's going on? Let's make sure to add a semicolon here, please. Yeah, notice that we are not using references here. Because essentially, um, hold on a second. What command pool? But yeah, anyways, 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 anyways. And save device to allocate command buffers. Create info. Now that we set it the command pool, we have to tell it how much command buffers we want. 
So essentially you have to tell it the command buffer count looks like. I only care about one command, there you go. And I don't care about vector of commands because well, at the end of the day, I'm just gonna have one command. I'm gonna say dot, uh, let's see, allocate command buffers, dot error into error. I'm gonna do the same thing as before, dot next. In fact, I can even say you're in wrap because this should just shouldn't happen. Well, well, it could happen that the API somehow gives me less, uh, no command buffers. So yeah, let's just do, do it the right way anyways. So context, you know, but this should normally never happens, but yeah, I guess create, uh, couldn't, uh, no command buffers. Okay. No command buffer found. And there you go. And now of course, I can go ahead, hopefully, do this. Oh yeah, let's make sure to not put the semicolon there. And there you go. So now, of course, uh, we got our command buffer. Argo R. Uh, everything is pretty cool stuff. And notice that I don't need to create to destroy the command buffer as well. Essentially, because when you destroy the command pool, they're automatically going to be get de deallocated. So yeah. All right. Now that I have created my command buffer. Now before recording the commands, I have to actually grab my create my buffers, etc. Okay. So now let's actually go ahead. Cargo add. What is it called? GPU allocator, right? Yeah, I guess. There you go, GPU allocator, cargo add. And by the way, here's the stuff that I, so GPU allocator I'm using right now 0.21.0. Um, yeah. So this is the latest uh, version basically while uh, recording this video, but yeah. Now let's actually try to create a buffer and just to not waste a lot of time here, let's just copy this sky because this is essentially what you need to do um, or let's go ahead one by one okay fine so here buffer create info uh, but essentially at the end of the day we want to create a buffer okay so let buffer is equal to what let's actually open that guy semicolon here let's not forget about that next up we're gonna say uh, vk uh, well, ash create buffer, or actually not ash. Oh my god, uh, device device dot create buffer. There you go. Uh huh. Create buffer, and I need the create info to do that, and I also need an allocation callbacks. There you go. And of course, this is an unsafe operation. Uh -huh. Now let's create our create info, but this could could error, right? Yes, it could error. So let's add this that guy. Now let's say let create info is equal to what? Uh, let's create info. So vk buffer create info builder dot what so you could do all sorts of stuff but I'm gonna start by size here you give it how much I believe how much bytes um, but essentially what we're gonna have is that I'm gonna have some data okay I'm gonna have some data you could use a vector or an array, doesn't matter. I'm gonna use an array. And essentially, let's actually start a symbol, you know. So value, we're gonna have some kind of value is equal to something. 
I don't know, let's say 3 and 14, whatever. Okay, and this value should be I32, okay? And how much values I'm gonna have? Well, let size is equal to, or N, how much values, so value count is equal to, let's say, for example, 16, okay? All right, lovely. Now, dot size, I'm gonna give it value count, but the thing is our value won't be a byte, you know? It will be uh, I32. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna say uh, divided by SCD mem uh, size of, and since this is made in uh, compile time, we gotta use this guy, this steerable fish thing. And we're gonna give it the I32. Of course, the And of course, this actually size expects U64. So let's give it that. In fact, uh, let's see. There you go. But in fact, I think it expects device size, not U64, right? Yeah, there you go. So you could say as VK device size. And essentially, VK device size internally just U64, I, I believe. So yeah. As VK device size. And that's essentially, actually no, uh, not divided by times because well, we have how much values and we want the bytes and the bytes will be multiplied, will be multiples of, of that. So yeah, so for example, here's 16, let's say the I32, well, it have four bytes. So it's gonna become 16 times four, which is uh, 32, I believe 64, I think, but yeah, anyways. So, hold on, what I said, 16 times four, yeah, 64, right. Uh, so, yep, yep, yep. Now that we created our buffer, now I have, we only created the handle to a buffer. And also, by the way, I forgot about uh, usage. So first of all, cargo FMT, no, didn't help, but yeah, fine, dot usage here. And I'm gonna tell the driver how um in why what is my intention on how I want to use this buffer. So vacate so we can optimize that further. And also allows me to do maybe some special things. I don't know. But yeah. Buffer usage flags. And here you want to tell it what it you want what you want to use this for. You want to use for it for uh, ray tracing, acceleration structure, etc., conditional rendering, index buffer, index buffer. Uh, vertex buffer, what you want exactly. In my case, I'm gonna go with a uh, uh, uniform buffer, I believe. Yeah, I'm gonna use it as a uniform because I'm just gonna use it for transfer, nothing really. If you want, for example, to use it with the uh, compute, then you want to to have it as a storage buffer, for example. But here I'm just gonna use as the U UBO uniform buffer. Uh huh. That's essentially it for that. Next up is the requirements. So we're gonna get the buffer memory requirements for that divide uh, for that buffer. But we have alloc that we have created, not allocated. We didn't allocate memory for that buffer yet. Essentially, and that's what we're trying to do here. Memory requirements. First of all, we want to get the memory requirements for that buffer that we want to allocate for. Is equal to and save uh -huh, device dot get memory, get buffer memory requirements. You give it the buffer, and it seems like it cannot fail. It just gives you memory requirements directly, so that's nice. Um, next up is you actually allocate. You use the allocator to allocate stuff up. And here where we're actually really gonna use our uh, GPU allocator. So allocation is equal to what? Is equal to allocator. Hold on. Uh, memory location. Uh, where 
is the allocator? Well, we still didn't actually create the allocator first of all. Let's create the allocator first of all. So let, let's see, debug settings, buffer device address. So let's create the allocator. It should be mutable. Well, because you want to use it for allocations. So allocator new. And of course I have to use this guy, use GPU allocator Vulcan. Let's put it on top there. Overwrite. Okay, allocator new. Uh, here I'm gonna give it the allocator Oh, allocator. Oh yeah, allocator. Create description, there you go. Uh, it's a struct. And essentially you give it the instance, you give it the, the device, the physical device, and you give it the debug settings. In this case, we're just gonna set it to default default essentially de default debug settings then buffer device address you can only use this before buffer device address if you have a special feature enabled so in my case i'm going to say false um, and of course i it did expect actually this guy a reference to that guy so Let's use kind of the same strategy that we did before. Scoping stuff up. Let allocator create description is equal to this stuff. There we go, semicolon. No need for a semicolon here. And we got an allocator as you can see, lovely. Now, after getting uh, that, why didn't it actually put this into a variable? Let buffer. Okay, now the problem is here, somehow the allocator moves these values, which is kind of annoying. So we're going to clone those values and give it the cloned values to own. So it doesn't own our own, our stuff. Oh yeah. And since it's no longer the same name, we're going to say this. There you go. Physical device, no need to clone it because it's not uh, created. It's just a handle to a number essentially. So yeah. Um, and that's basically it. Memory requirements, create buffer. Okay. And now after this, after getting the requirements, now we have to create the allocations. Uh, the allocation. So let's allocation is equal to allocator dot allocate. And here you give it a allocator allocation create description. Allocator, create description is equal to what? To, well, allocation create disk like this, allocation. There we go. Now let's, we need the name of the allocation. This is just for tracking and debugging purposes. The Vulkan memory requirements for an allocation, the location where the mem memory allocation should be stored, every resource is linear, buffer linear texture, or regular time texture. Uh, linear. So, well, every buffer is linear. So, yeah. So, first of all, they said we need the name. In my case, let's just say buffer. I don't know. Uh, buffer allocation. Uh, the this would be useful in debugging purposes, like when you have a problem with allocations and it can tell you exactly basically the name of that buffer. So yeah, when you have multiple allocations, 
uh, which would be really useful. Uh, but yeah, requirements. Here I'm going to give it the memory requirements. Well, just to be more descriptive, I'm going to say buffer memory requirements, okay? Although to be honest, since we're in the in the in the context of creating a buffer, fine. Let's stick to by okay. So location. Now we need to use the location. So which location they're talking about? Memory location, oh yeah. Memory location. Should I like import this guy? Yeah, import it. Now I can say which memory uh, location we want. Is it ZP CPU to GPU, GPU only, GPU to CPU, or no? So essentially you declare here uh, where you want to allocate this resource essentially, some sort. So here, if you said unknown, the allocated resource is stored at an unknown memory location, let the driver decide what's the best location. Otherwise, store the allocation in GPU only accessible memory. Typically, this is the faster GPU resource. This should be where most of the allocations live. This is the dedicated memory essentially. Uh, here, memory useful for uploading data to the GPU and potentially for constant buffers. And you have memory useful for CPU read, read back of data. Okay, now I'm not going to be uploading data, at least for now. And um, I do need to access the, alloc the buffer from CPU. So I cannot use GPU only and I don't need to upload. So I don't need this in known kind of obscure. I don't want that. So I'm going to be, go I'm going to go with GPU to CPU because I want to read the the data from the CPU after the GPU is done. So we're gonna say GPU to CPU. <laughs> there you go. And of course the linear, well, linear for any buffer, it's gonna be true. Because you could allocate some other things like an image, for example, a child image, etc. Anyways, uh, buffer allocation, linear true. And so let's make sure to, okay, so we got our allocation essentially right now. And the next thing is to bind memory to the buffer because yeah, we created the buffer and we created the allocation, but we didn't bind them together. We didn't tell Vulkan that this buffer is using this allocation, etc. So let's bind that stuff. So in safe, I think device.bind mem buffer memory. There you go. You give it the buffer the device memory and the offset device memory uh, ye, what what do you mean by device memory let's see oh yeah oh yeah this is just uh, the ide okay so here I'm going to give it the uh, allocation, allocation, right? I believe. Yeah, allocation and allocation will tell me which memory and it will tell me the offset of that memory. And you should make sure to set the offset. Now, if we were to, to allocate ourselves and allocate a buffer, like some memory for each, like to, to allocate memory for each buffer, then we don't need a uh, offset. It's just going to be always zero since each allocation is only for one buffer. But since the allocator here will choose to whatever whatever memory you want, you could do it in one memory, two memories, doesn't matter. The allocator will take responsibility of that uh, to best uh, for, for the most, you know, like optimal way of doing it. And, and I'm gonna get the offset. So if uh, the allocator have decided to put it in the same memory and then there is some offset, then there you go, which is amazing. All right, so that's how you do it essentially for binding the memory buffer, bind memory to the buffer. And then of course, at the end of the day, you have to do some cleanup. So of course, anything that you create, you have to destroy. And then you can free the allocation using the allocator. So, 
And you don't need to destroy the alligator because, well, it's an actual G, uh, like uh, rust object, okay? So it's gonna deallocate de itself. Uh, I mean, uh, destroy itself when the main function is done. So allocator, of course, dot uh, free allocation. And now since this is a case, okay, I've seen something so bad here. <laughs> a big, big problem. Okay, so the allocation should live long, as long as the buffer, you know. <laughs> so yeah, interesting. So yeah, in fact, I just kind of lost track right there for a second. So memory requirements. Hmm. Well, at least the allocation should live as long. And so that means, well, we're essentially just gonna say this. So I'm just gonna return the buffer directly here in this case. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, in safe, there you go. And after that, I'm just gonna create the memory requirements, the allocation create description, now for the allocation, I can do the same thing, the same guy. So yeah. Mm -hmm. bind memory, bind memory, and then give it the allocation. So the thing is, I don't care about memory requirements and allocation of rate description. Uh, okay, so yeah. Memory requirements. So memory requirements is just size aligned memory type bits. So they're just numbers, so there's no need to care about it. Yeah, so allocation of rate description, we don't need it anymore after creating the allocation, and there you go. So that's how it works, really. And after that, I'm just binding the buffer memory and then, well, returning the allocation. Lovely. Semicolon, of course. And there you go, allocator.free allocation. And of course, it can actually return an error. So let's add that interrogation mark. And after that, we can destroy our buffer. In safe. Device dot destroy buffer. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm thinking I should be kind of, yeah, I should be kind of, uh, there is something that I've, okay, allocation callbacks none. Let's first of all do this. So buffer and there you go. So this is how you destroy the buffer. Now what I'm thinking about is should I destroy the buffer first or the command pool first? Now the command pool allocates the command buffers, okay? Now the command buffers could reference the buffer. In fact, it will reference it in my case. Well, of course, I'm going to make sure that that won't happen. Uh, and like I'm not going to exit the application until the command buffer is finished with its stuff. But just for the sake of safety, I'm just going to actually destroy the command pool first. Okay. And in fact, let's just create the command uh, command pool for us, uh, you know, after creating the buffer stuff. So command buffer and command pool, let's not create them until we created the buffers. Okay. I think this is a much wiser way of doing it. So yeah allocator dot free and of course before doing this cleanup stuff we're gonna create our command pool and, and there you go lovely now cargo of mt and there you go look at that lovely code lovely okay now command buffer now we're pretty much ready to do our our job so first of all in safe we're gonna begin recording to the command buffer.
Okay, so be in save command buffer. Uh, in fact, not command buffer. Well, device dot begin command buffer. Here you give it the command buffer. Then you give it begin info. Um, now begin command buffer. It won't return anything, but it returns vacant results. But as you can see, void for the if if everything went well. Uh, but yeah, I just gotta do something like this. Now for the begin info, this is interesting. I mean, I can just say this. Don't need to return anything in this case. So here I'm just gonna have let begin info is equal to what? To uh, begin info. Well, vacay. Uh huh. Begin. What? What it takes? Hold on a second. Yo, bro. Command buffer begin info. Okay. So vacay command buffer begin info. Don't know why it doesn't. Uh, I think because I missed the reference. Yes, probably. So uh, next up is the builder and then dot. Here I can give it some stuff. Like there is the flags. Command buffer usage flags. Where is the command buffer usage flags? There we go. Here, as you can see, there's one time submit, render pass continue, simultaneous use. Uh, now you could go ahead to the documentation and read all about it. No, I don't want to. Well, anyways, never mind. So, anyway, bit mask specify and usage behavior for command buffer. Bit switch can be set in command uh, buffer begin info flags. Um, specify and usage behavior for command buffer R. Mm -hmm. One time submit bit. Specifies that each recording of the command buffer will only be submitted once and the command buffer will be reset and recorded again between each submission. Uh, well, I don't care since I'm not gonna reuse the command buffer anyways. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, I don't care about uh, this uh, flags for now, in my case. So, yes, no need for flags. I don't think I need anything else. I mean, there's only flags, and there's inheritance info, which I don't care about. I don't have secondary command buffers. Oh, uh, talking about secondary and, hold on a second. Uh... Yeah, where I should actually tell it that is a primary command buffer. I mean, when I did that, did I miss that or what? Uh, hold on a second. <laughs> command buffer allocate info. Allocate. Allocate info. So, yeah, I didn't set the level. I forgot to set the level, right? Um, so... Here in command buffer allocate info builder dot level, and I'm give it the vk command buffer level. I'm gonna tell it primary command buffer. Okay, there's also secondary command buffers. Now, uh, the easiest analogy I can give you to what is the difference between primary and secondary is that the main function is kind of like the primary uh, command buffer. And then any other function that you call from main is the secondary command buffer. You know. <laughs> um, so essentially, the primary command buffer is what you actually go ahead and submit to the queue for execution. Secondary command buffers are just there for you to call or execute from uh, the primary command buffer. So yeah, essentially that's it. So you could essentially create, uh, record one command buffer once and then reuse it in multiple primary command buffers, for example. Uh, but yeah, 
and that's essentially it and we have begun the command for well anything that begins should end so uh, well yeah if it doesn't begin though then well mm, doesn't necessarily have an end uh, so yeah um, Okay, so end command buffer, this function takes one argument. Okay, so this guy takes only one argument. And notice that even end command buffer uh, takes a, can give an error. Um, and we're gonna notice here is that when you execute commands, it doesn't give you errors at all. It just returns nothing, void. Um, and you may actually question this, but basically, you don't get errors when you you need recording. Only when you end the command buffer that you get any errors of the recorded commands. Okay, essentially that's the case. Uh, but yeah, now I'm gonna use uh one. I'm gonna use one of the commands. Okay, so device dot vk. Well, not vk. Cmd, right? Cmd. Uh, fill buffer. Now there's a lot of things about buffer. You can copy data, fill. So if you have like, let's say two buffers, then you can copy data between them. There's update buffer, bind index, copy image, bind vertex buffer, etc. But the easiest and simplest I believe is fill buffer. You give it the command buffer. You give it the buffer you're talking about that you want to fill. Then you give it the offset of that buffer. Well, I have to actually use that. Hold on a second. Uh, yeah, allocation and say allocation dot memory. Okay, here uh, allocation dot size, and here I can give it the data, which is in my case value. This is basically what you want to fill. Uh, that thing with. Expected U64. Uh, oh, I've done something wrong here. Oh yeah, it doesn't need a uh, memory. It does need offset. Yeah, it needs offset and size. Okay, first. And of course, in the in save function there, and of course, it doesn't give you any result as you can see. So you can can check for errors. In fact, you check for errors here. Uh, uh, hold on a second. Uh, I don't need this begin info. You check it when you end the command buffer. Okay. And since I only have one thing here, we don't need this guy. Save. And there you go. Card of FMT. Lovely. And there you go. Awesome. That's all the only command that I need. Now, after finishing recording the command buffer, so let me just add a bit. So this is cleanup. Uh, this is recording command buffer. Okay. Uh, this is creating, create, create allocator. Uh -huh. create buffer uh, this is essentially the context stuff context okay so that's essentially it uh, although this value count and I'm gonna put this I'm gonna call it config or something Value count, value, blah, blah, blah. Right, so yeah, that's essentially it. Nice, nice, nice. All right, now I have to actually submit, uh, execute the command buffer. Or essentially, by, by uploading it to the GPU through the queue, right? So that's essentially what we're gonna do right now. And 
so device dot q submit is also q submit too, which is I think is an extension. So q submit q. So you give it the queue that you want to submit to. You give it multiple submits. And I'm gonna use that slice uh, trick since I'm only have one, I only have one submit right here. And I can give it a fence. A fence is basically, now the thing is when I'm gonna call this queue submit, it's not gonna wait for, it's not gonna stop the execution of the program and wait for the, the operation to, like the command buffer to be executed for the queue to submit that stuff, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's not gonna wait for any of these, this stuff. It's just gonna return immediately and let the GPU do the work. Let the driver do the work, actually. Let the driver and the GPU do the work, right? Uh, but we could use a fence and basically you could create a fence and then give Q submit this fence and then it will go ahead and signal this fence for us when the GPU have finished executing this, uh, when the, of course, when the driver finished submitting or uploading this command buffer to the GPU and when the GPU have finished uh, executing that command buffer. It's going to signal this fence and then we basically you can wait until this fence is signaled. All right, so that's essentially it. Well, first of all, let me actually create a fence, which we can wait for, because I do want to wait for the command to execute, then I want to read the data of the buffer uh, from the CPU, essentially. So let's say, let's see, let's see, let's see. So let, uh, let's see, let fence, okay. And safe. Uh, all right, let's just open that guy. Safe uh, device. So create fence. There you go. We have create info, none for allocations, reference to create info, and let's create info is equal to. Okay. So how we do this and by the way let's actually since this is a result let's do that and now create info is vk fence create info oh not flags info let's get the builder and dot build there's also flags here but i don't care there's also for example like for example a flag called signaled okay uh and that flag essentially is uh, you can, in each, so when you just create the fence, it's going to be in the in signaled state, but you could actually pass it that uh, flag so it can actually start as a signaled state, in signal state. So yeah, that's essentially what you do. But in my case, I don't need that. Such a, I don't need such a thing. So this operation is in safe and safe. And in fact, this is not execution. This is execution. This is just uh, creating synchronization objects. Okay. Uh, all right, so submits. Now I'm gonna, as I, as I said, since I only have one submit, I'm gonna use that slice trick from ref and I'm going to give it the reference or to the submit. And let's just do that trick scoping. This is essentially Q submit info. VK uh, Q. What is it called? Submit info it's called, okay. Not Q. There you go, builder dot. Now here you have to give it the command buffers you're talking about. And in our case, since we have only one command buffer, again, I'm gonna use std slice from ref. I'm gonna reference my command buffer. 
Hold on, do I really need this? Hold on, no. Well, yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it's Fexit semicolon, right? Yep, there you go, nice. Uh -huh. Command buffers. What's next? Do I need anything else? Uh, signal semaphores, wait DST stage. Uh -huh. Wait semaphore. Yeah, this should be enough, hopefully. Although we could maybe wait for a specific stage. In our case, it's going to be the transfer. I don't know if I want to do this. But, you know, let's just uh, not give it anything else. Just the command buffer right now. The key submit, and there you go. Awesome. Now, this should go ahead and do the trick for us. Now, wait for the execution. Is it complete? So, what we're going to do right now is fence. Well, fence, no, 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 no. device dot wait for fence, fences, right here. Once again, I, I can give it multiple fences. CD slice from ref, one fence, fence. I can give it true or false. So like if you have multiple fences, then you can tell it to wait for all of those fences or to wait for only one of them to complete. Well, it doesn't matter since I only have one one fence, so it doesn't matter if you say true or false in this case, but let's just say true, I guess. Uh, timeout. Here I'm just going to give it a U64 max. Uh, so here you can give it a timeout value. I'm just going to tell it to, to wait indefinitely, no timeout, by essentially giving it a max, the max value possible. Okay, so in safe, Uh, right. That should do the trick. That should do the trick. Now I can essentially, hopefully, read the data. Okay. And how I'm gonna read the data? Well, I can say memory dot. Well, not memory. Um, I guess allocation. Yeah, you say allocation dot mapped. Mapped. Slice. So if you want to edit it, you know, edit the data inside, you could say slice mutable. But in my case, I just want to read, so I'm going to say map slice. So for value in allocation dot map slice. Okay, for loop over an option, it's not reasonable as. Now this map slice is an option. It could return some valid map slice if the memory is host visible. Otherwise, it will return none. So let's say, for example, if the buffer is actually allocated in GPU, then this will return none because you cannot actually do such a thing, right? Um, but slide always read references to the exact memory region of the allocation. But you could ask me how, like, let's say I'm using a buffer that is inside the GPU only. I can only access from the GPU. So how can I put data or get data from it in my application using the CPU? Well, you just simply can't. But you can do something, which is that you could create multiple, two buffers, one that is accessible by the CPU and one that is inside the GPU only, the dedicated memory. And what you could do, well, in fact, the also the, the one that is able to be accessed by the CPU could probably be even inside the, the GPU dedicated memory, but it is in a special place where it could be accessed by the CPU anyways. And that special place is actually limited in GPUs. It's, uh, uh, but the other way around, that only only GPU accessible is is much more uh, abundant than uh, than the one that you can access from the CPU. But yeah, essentially you're gonna create two buffers. One that is host visible, that you can actually go ahead and read and upload, like read and write data to from the CPU. 
and one that is only inside the GPU, that is only accessible inside the GPU. And then in your buffer, you could, you could create a command called copy. So you could copy the buffer uh, that is accessible. For, so you could basically, first of all, write data to the buffer, to the accessible CPU accessible buffer, and then essentially copy data from that CPU accessible buffer in your, bu in your command buffer. You could tell the GPU to go ahead, copy the, the CPU accessible buffer data to the, to the GPU only, okay? A buffer and that's how you essentially uh, uploaded data to the to that GPU only buffer and you could imagine the same kind of thing uh, happening with the other way around of actually reading data but yeah essentially you're gonna tell the GPU to copy a memory of data of that GPU only uh, buffer to that CPU accessible buffer and then go from to the CPU. Once the execution have finished, you can actually read the data. You got the point. So hopefully. Now in allocation.map slice, so now I'm just making sure to that that it is actually some instead of none, but I cannot use this unless if I say context. I cannot access buffer. from CPU. Well, essentially in Vulkan, uh, instead of saying CPU and GPU, we actually say host. Because, you know, uh, the host, especially the device could be a lot of things. In fact, the, the, the device could even be the CPU itself if it's, it supports the Vulkan, okay? That's why we say host and device. Host basically refer, refers to commonly, well, the CPU and the device commonly is the GPU, but yeah. Uh, so cannot access buffer from host. Now, the thing is this guy gives me an address to a value, a U8 value, okay? So now let's try to print line that guy. So that value basically and see what we have there. Okay, cargo FMT, cargo R. We have some problems, first of all. Okay, so it has not been destroyed. So I didn't destroy the VK device memory. Where I created that device memory? I have some memory leak, I believe. Okay, hold on a second. Where is that memory leak? Memory leak, uh, device memory. Hold on. But this is actually managed by the allocation, so. Allocation, right, it is created by the allocation, I believe. So allocation, allocate, yeah, it is managed by that. So it should be good to go here. Destroy command pool. Destroy buffer. Allocator dot free. Did I destroy the buffer? There you go, I did destroy the buffer. So what's going on exactly? Uh, but first of all, let's me first of all destroy the, what is it? The fence, yeah. Let's destroy first of all the fence. So fence, I do that. By the way, before actually, this, yeah, I need to do this before. Yeah, let's go. So essentially destroy buffer allocator free. Although no, uh, 
Maybe we destroy, yeah. Maybe we destroy buffer first, then free the allocation. Hold on, but here, no, they're freeing the allocation first, then destroying the buffer. So I believe that's the right way to do it. I don't know, but it does make sense to me to do it the other way around, but maybe, I don't know. Uh, or maybe the allocator actually goes ahead and invites memory for me, stuff like that. Anyways, so in safe, in safe device dot destroy fence. Here I'm gonna give it the fence that we have. And allocation fallbacks none. This gives an option. What do you mean? Oh no no, it doesn't give an option. Yeah, it doesn't give anything. Right. Interesting. So that's essentially it, hopefully. And hopefully this time it doesn't give me any errors. There is still one error, which is about that VK device memory has not been destroyed. That um, all shard creation investments have been destroyed prior to destroying device. Uh, okay, so somehow I'm destroying the device. And in fact, I even got a status access violation. What? What if I'd done it the other way around, maybe? I'm still getting the same problem. Okay, sorry. Uh, destroying the buffer. Well, I believe it should actually free itself, no? Oh, did, did I destroy the allocator? Well, maybe I have to actually delete the allocator. How do you drop? Maybe I have to drop the allocator at this point. Before, uh, yeah, maybe. Drop the allocator, then destroy buffer. Yeah, there you go. So because the allocator is managing those uh, memories and somehow it doesn't do that. Maybe just keeping that memory allocation for to use it later on, basically to reuse it uh, even after the device is done. But there you go. So after dropping that thing, we're all good. Everything is fine. Interesting. Um, so let's go main.rs please. Main.rs. Okay. Nice, nice, nice. Now we're good to go. Cargo FMT. Awesome. 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 Now let's go back to our uh, thing here. So now we have a problem here, a little problem. Why? So we have, we get uh, 58, we get one, zero, zero, 58, one, zero, zero. What I really expect is to actually get a 16, 314 values, but I'm getting this. Why that's the case? Well, because now, this value is what? It's it's U32. And U32 is four bytes. Okay. And here the slice is given to me as eight bytes. Okay. So notice that every time it actually one, the first byte, the second byte, the third byte, the fourth byte, the first byte, the second byte, the third byte, the fourth byte. Okay. Now 58. Uh huh. Fifty eight plus one times hmm, plus one times two hundred fifty six. Now, if I say fifty eight, hold on a second. I just we're gonna try something here. Fifty eight plus one times well two hundred fifty six. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, essentially, 256 plus 58. Okay. 
I get 340. <laughs> so we in fact having 340, but in four bytes, right? So we're here, we're seeing the first byte, the second byte, the third byte, and the fourth byte. If you go ahead like this, then it is, does make sense. Because, I mean, let me let me make it much easier on you, okay? If I say 255 here, what's going to happen? Or go R? Let's see. So I get 255, but zero here. If I say 256, it's going to go to the second byte now. So as you can see, in the second byte, I'm getting one, and the other byte zeros. But essentially, we're looking into every byte. Um, so now the question is, how can I actually uh, convert this? Uh, or actually not convert, but read this this buffer, not in U8s, not in bytes, but in U32s. U32s in four bytes, four bytes per, per four bytes, okay? So, well, there is a really nice crate that we can use to do this. So use, let's see, not use, <laughs> cargo add, uh, byte mark, it's called byte mark, okay? This is a really interesting crate, it's really useful for such things. I always use it for such uh, bitey things, right? So. Uh huh. Now I could say let data is equal to. Okay, um, allocation maps. So I can say byte mark cast. Hold on, byte mark cast slice. Yeah, cast slice. There you go, and then I could give it, and by the way, this casting happens in compile time, which is really awesome. Uh, but yeah, so map slice context allocation. So I'm gonna grab this guy here. I'm gonna put it in this guy. I expected semicolon, of course. And here I need to tell it which, what I'm, what I'm expecting. I'm expecting a slice of U32. Twos, I believe, or I thirty twos, yeah, I thirty twos, right? Uh, and as you can see, okay, so there you go. So I'm basically telling it by mark that I want a slice of I thirty two here, and now I can say for value in data. What do you mean by try using? Oh, oh, never mind. Uh, Python. <laughs> okay. So for value in data, now let's try this guy. Cargo FMT, first of all, and cargo R. Let's go. And there you go. Now I'm getting the value. I'm getting 16 of those values, as you can notice here. Pretty lovely. Now I actually made the GPU go ahead and, and fill a buffer with some values and you can in fact go ahead right now and do all sorts of crazy stuff uh, so let value we'll do 256 256 mm, so we could try something else like let's say 13 for example let's see make sure it's still working uh, as you can see, it's still working. All right, so I'm making the GPU uh, clear the, and you could you could see how it would be uh, pretty nice when you have like a lot of values, like a really big buffer. The GPU can easily uh, take that whole buffer and set it to the, that value. All right, and there you go. <laughs> pretty cool stuff, isn't it? Pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool. Uh, awesome, 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 awesome. Now, what we could do, uh, we could actually take that buffer and save it as an image, even if you want to. <laughs> and let's do that. So to do that, well, 
first of all, cargo add image. So we have another crate called image. And by the way, just to show you, this is the libraries that I'm using. This is the versions. So if you have a problem with any of those, uh, then make sure to use uh, my the versions that I'm using right here so as to have similar experience to me uh, but yeah clean up clean up clean up clean up now as I added this image right now I can go ahead before clean up and instead of reading this data like this I do need this data right so let's leave it like that uh, but essentially, 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 I can say image. Okay, so the Rust analyzer is still doing its job. As you can see, cargo check. Uh, there you go. Now image. There you go. Nice. Save buffer. So here I can give it the path where to save it. Im Im image.png. Here I can give it the buffer, in my case it's data, as you can see it's a buffer of U8s. Well in fact this is U8s, uh, so U8s, and I think it's RGBA, I don't know, I don't remember. Well, that's kind of problematic, but yeah, and here let's just say U8s. Okay, syntax. Well, in fact, I can right now just pass in this allocation map slice directly to this guy because I don't need byte mug anymore, it seems like. Um, because this takes you eights anyways. Uh, context, I do need this context thing. And no need for this anymore. Uh, although I do need this. Variable. Okay, allocation dot. Yo, what else? What's happening? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, nice. Cargo FMT, please. Uh, add semicolon there. Okay, nice. So allocation .map slice context. then add the data directly. Here you can give it a width, a height, and a color. Oh yeah, now here where you actually give it the, yeah, nice, 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 pretty nice. So we can say image color type. So this is, let's see. So we could say RGB 32 L 16. Mm -hmm. RGBA8. So RGBA8. No, not RGBA8. Let's see what we want. We could say, oh yeah, nice. We could say L8, I guess. Nice. So basically black and white for each byte. Um, so width and height. Now I can actually declare that width and height. Cannot find value with in the scope, not found in the scope, nice. So yeah, we could start by L8, so that's nice. So each, each, uh... no, 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 no. I want a 32 bit value if possible. Because in fact, right now, since I'm, the thing is this, this, uh, the GPU is using four bytes each time. Uh, so I basically right here. Hmm. Well, I could say L16. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Uh, but yeah, so let's see. Let's just see what's going to happen. Okay, fine. Let's just see what's going to happen. Uh, let's go not go crazy right now. <laughs> With equal to what? Let's say seven of twenty. Let height seven of twenty. And let's say value count is well width uh, times height. But not just that. Like I need to account for which type I'm using. So I'm using 
L16, right? So L16, which means, uh, well, height. So each two pixels is, now it's kind of like I have each two, each two pixels in one, in one value. So we're gonna say divide by two, right? Because L16, if it was L13 or L32, then we could have easily done such a thing, but sadly we don't, so. Actually, hold on a second. I mean, can't I? Hold on, hold on. No, I can, I can say RGBA. RGBA8, right. So I could say RGB, yeah, nice, nice, never mind. RGB8. And why incorrect? What's incorrect about it? Expected, oh yeah, so I'll just cast the C32s. C32s. Oh yeah, right now I know what to do, okay, fine. So right now we don't need any of these guys because RGB8, because there's four components, uh, each component have eight bytes, eight times four is 32, there you go. Boom, nice, lovely. Uh, so with height, I don't need to do a divide by two or whatever because well, it's U32, nice. So now here is the value. Now this is the nice thing. Uh, okay, let's see what's gonna happen right now. Cargo R. This is gonna be really interesting. <laughs> Never tried it though. I mean, I tried the, the but I didn't try the image stuff. So here we're gonna see if it's gonna fail or succeed. I, I never really tried it using the images, you know, like saving it to an image. It just said an afterthought right now. So, um, hmm. Oh yeah, uh, there's, oh, oh, interesting, interesting validation. Although it doesn't really matter, but hold on a second, image, PNG. Oh yeah, seems like the lower, Hmm. Interesting. Uh, well, hold on a second. Let me fix one thing real quick. Uniform buffer. Now, instead of what is it called? VK buffer should have VK buffer usage. Yeah, transfer DSC. Instead of uniform, since I'm using it for transfer, uh, since I'm using the VK CMD fill buffer, uh, I can use this uh, transfer DSC. This is the, the best way of doing it, okay. So let's actually do this once again. Okay, but the image is still like this because I need to figure out the RGBA kind of way of doing it, right? So. So if I, if I say 24, I'm kind of trying to figure out how it, how the RGBA components are ordered. Okay. I got, what? Hold on. No, I didn't expect this. Uh, five. So one bit, right? Five, one bit. Oh yeah, one, one bit. Now this is it. So one, so here I'm saying 24. Oh yeah, so the alpha. Okay, so I'm setting here the alpha, interesting. Nice, 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 nice. So I figured it out, I guess. So the alpha is the, the What? <laughs> Hold on, what? For example, 125. Okay, so it's kind of like almost half transparent, right? So this is actually uh, alpha. So this is the alpha, okay. So alpha, let's say 255. 
All right, nice. Now, what if I said this? Okay, let's see. And that's the orbit, the, so, I don't know what it's called, bit or, okay. Nice, so yeah, the least significant bits are for red. The, the most significant bits are for alpha, okay, lovely. So this is how you can essentially do it. Uh -huh, alpha, this is red. Nice, so there you go. We can actually right now go ahead, use the GPU to clear an image and save it to the disk. Nice, um, pretty cool. And this is a really, really good step. Lovely, so let red, let green, uh, 255, let blue, 255. Okay, of course the lowest value is zero. The, the, the biggest value is 255, okay? So yeah. Um, yeah, nice. Although one thing, I. If I remember well, I'm using i32 in CD32. Hold on a second. If we go to a CD memof, I think I've done a little error right there. Not really a big uh, issue because i32 and u32 are the same size, but well, technically it's, it's u32, not a32, right? Because the value in fact is u32. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, essentially. So that is lovely, awesome, 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 amazing. So red alpha, uh -huh. now we're gonna do some more. I'm gonna do green, eight bits, shift to eight bits, and or, or is like plus in the bit land, so, and red, green, I'm shifting eight bits, then blue, shift to 16 bits. So essentially in the powers of two, uh-huh. Actually, not powers of two, well, uh, multiples of eight, okay? So, because one b byte is eight bit, so yeah. Um, cargo R. Image, and there you go, white, lovely. Amazing. So right now, uh, instead of recompiling this every time, I can actually use Let's see, I don't remember it, CD args. I don't really remember. Uh, oh yeah, maybe a CD. I really. So, hold on, let me try to actually use it. You know what, let's just go ahead, look for it. Rust. SCDNV, right. Uh -huh. There you go. So SCDNV. SCDNV. Now let's say NV, arcs. Now what this gives me? Arcs, okay. I think this is a, yeah, this is an iterator. So I can say dot next to get the first argument essentially. But to be honest, the, uh, so let's get the arcs here. I'm gonna grab it right here. Gonna store the iterator right there. And I'm gonna skip the first one because the first one is just the program's path. And there we go. Now I can just say arcs dot next to get the first guy and of course uh, propagate error if there is mm, if the width doesn't exist essentially so context width is required okay same thing for the other guys height is required the problem though with this is that it gives you a string. The, 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 the args are strings, so you have to parse it. So dot parse, and you have to tell it how to parse it, I believe, maybe. 
Well, first of all, let's propagate error if they fail to parse. Let's do the same thing, I believe, for the other guys. Don't know if you can infer this. Trade bound is not satisfied. Oh, well, maybe I, I have to actually tell it that I want, uh, let's say, U32 or whatever. Uh, let's just say you size. Okay, nice. Now, let's say height is required. There you go. Value count with times height. Alpha, red, green, and blue. Nice. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, hold on. Back, 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 back. As you can see, red, green, alpha. Okay, nice. So, by the way, this computed values, let's just remove them from the config, or at least let's put them down there. Uh, in fact, yeah, let's just remove them from the config, to be honest. Value, red, green, yeah, th these are all computed, so let's put them where they're used. They're being used. Uh, okay, where they're being used. Value count at least is being used here. And the value is being used here. So yeah, essentially. And now you can essentially do the same thing with the other guys. But in here, I do need user 2 instead. And with that, I can say cargo R. Uh, well, this should be 64, I believe. Right, yeah. Since it's, um, okay. Oh, uh, it should be mutable because I'm advancing in the iterator, so cargo R. As you can see, error width is required. Nice, 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 nice. So I can see now I can give it the width as the first argument, uh, the height as the second one, the alpha. Uh, well, alpha should be actually the, the last argument, really. Yeah, red, green, blue, alpha, right. The, the order depends on the line because, well, I'm using dot next here, as you can notice the, there. So yeah, cargo R, uh -huh, 720 for the width, height from 80, and then red, I can say, I don't know, uh, zero, 255 for green, for example, zero for blue, alpha, always 255 in my case, and there you go. Now, if I go to image, as you can see, I got green, nice. Now I can blue, for example. There you go, lovely. Uh, white by name red. Nice. As you can notice, <laughs> I just made a beautiful tool right here. I can even do maybe 4K. Let's try 4K. Uh, so, uh, hold on a second. Calculator, please. Um, 48 times 2, yeah, 4096, 4096, it's gonna take some time to save it, so, but yeah, most of the time is being uh, wasted in, in saving the image, because saving the image as PNG takes a lot of time, especially that this is debug build, so we could actually build it as release. And it's going to be much, much faster, especially for saving. So, yeah. Oh my God, let's go. This is 4K that we generated right now. It took a little while, to be honest. So, uh, 
because of saving. But we could make it faster by compiling it for release. So let's go ahead. It's going to take a little bit of time because we have a lot of uh, crates right there. We have anyhow, ash, byte mug, TP allocator, and image. And we're I I don't think I compiled before with release uh, for any of these crates. I don't know. Uh, I don't remember. I may have done for some, I don't know, to be honest. Anyways, and there you go. Let's wait for it to compile. It's going to take a little while. Still, you know, it's released. And this is the first time to compile is released. So, rayon, PNG. And yeah, I'm actually gonna go ahead and add also as a little touch, little final touch to tell how much time it took for it to, first of all, to, to render to the, to basically to fill, for the GPU to fill the, the, the buffer. And the second thing, how much it took for the image to save, maybe. But yeah. Now it's running in release, nice. And as you can see, it did took a really a little time. So notice, this is 4K. This is how much it, <laughs> so fast, really so fast. So just as a final touch, as I said, let's try to do that. So I'm gonna say use STD time. Uh-huh, and now uh, where we're waiting for the command buffer to execute. So here, we're waiting for here. So here I'm gonna say, let start is equal to, let's see, instant, well, at time instant or what is, what is, yeah, instant time instant. Now, I want to get the now instant instant now so next up i'm going to say print line uh -huh. print line uh, execution gpu took you know then i'm going to tell and say time instant now minus start, okay. And I'm gonna use the debug uh, printer. And there you go. Now I can do the same exact thing for the f image uh, saving. So save buffer. So yeah, that's essentially it. Now let's try this up. Uh -huh. And as you can see, GPU took six milliseconds, 6.46 milliseconds to, to do that. The saving took 645 milliseconds. Pretty cool, this is for 4K, bro. 4K, nice. Uh, what about HD? Let's see what's going to happen there. Now, as you can see, the GPU took 791 microseconds and the saving took 20 milliseconds for that. Of course, in release build. Pretty cool stuff. All right, so that was it for this video. We have created a beautiful little program using Vulkan only. We didn't use any swap chain, any graphics, any compute. It just transfer one transfer operation, fill operation. Um, and that's been, this is basically the basics, the basics of Vulkan we have covered in this video. Pretty cool. All right, so that was it for this video and see you later. Bye everyone.